Well, I've got my white candle. I have a cool glass filled to the top with water. I even brought my favorite notebook and pen. I think I'm ready to start working with the dead. But you know what? I wish I had someone to help guide me a little bit. Like a mentor. Or an oracle. Operator, connect me to Oracle Hecateos. Welcome to Music, Myth, and Magic. I'm Eric Arcadian, and today I'm speaking to Oracle Hecateos. Oracle is the author of the book Strixcraft, a priest of the goddess Hecate, and an initiate in the multiple traditions, including the Minoan Brotherhood, New York Wicca, Gardnerian, and Alexandrian. Oracle, thank you so much for being on the show with me today. Thanks so much, Eric. I am excited to be here. Thank you so much for inviting me to be on this show. I, I am thrilled. Well, I'm really happy to have you here today. And I was wondering to get started, if you wouldn't mind telling us a little bit about how you got started on your path. Yeah, absolutely. Um, I, okay, so <laughs> I'm a former ordained Christian minister. And um, I, my, my father, however, never converted. And he was interested in the occult and he was interested in paranormal stuff. And that's what I grew up with before we went to the church. And my mother was uh, in Santeria, Lukumi. She was a daughter of Yamaya. So I grew up in that kind of household and we were Catholic and stuff in, in, in as well, presenting. Um, one of the things that happened was because those seeds were planted by my dad, later on I had a falling out with the church. And I began to... Um, I began to really follow my heart as to there must be more than what I was taught. There must be a whole lot more out there. And so I began to study the Bible in, in the ancient languages, but the original languages. And I realized that it led me to understand, I almost converted to Judaism actually, but the further I studied, the further I began to realize that the divine feminine was missing. And because it led me to books like the Hebrew goddess and when God was a woman. And finally, the divine feminine led me into um, polytheism and paganism. My first path initially was Druidry. I'm a member of the Order of Bards, Oates, and Druids, and the Druid Order of Naturalists. Um, that was my first foray. Later on, I became interested in witchcraft. I didn't know what it was, really. But I was interested in it, and I started seeking. And the very first path that I came across was the Minoan Brotherhood. Um... And for those that do not know, the Minoan Brotherhood is a is a men's initiatory tradition for gay and bisexual men. And there is a partnership, the Minoan Sisterhood, that we have. And it was founded by Eddie um, Buzinski. So that's how my path started, was studying the Bible, realizing there were contradictions between the Bible and my church, and starting to follow it towards ancient history where the Israelites were, were Canaanites. There was polytheism. There were borrowings of the god El, the divine feminine, and then Druidry and then eventually witchcraft. What was it like being in, a, in a, such a mixed household as a kid where you had the Christian influences and the influences from uh, Lukumi as well? You know, well... Growing up, it was just what we did. I'm Mexican American, so it was just what it was. Just you know, there were, there was the Orisha, the saints, 
and we went to Catholic Church, and I went through catechism, but it didn't seem to contradict anything. And then my father didn't believe in any of it, really, but he was into the, like I said, he was into the occult and paranormal on, in his own way. And so we had a vast library of different things. Um, we had books on reincarnation. We had books on, uh, you know, ghosts and healings and, you know, Elizabeth Clare Prophet and Edgar Cayce. The original book of the Mists of Avalon, which I still have for my dad, the hardcover copy when it first came out. Um, so, I mean, we had quite a bit of different things that were in our library. And it helped plant seeds that later on would blossom into where I am now. So, I I believe I when I was reading um, a little bit about you in your book, you had kind of like a calling. Mm -hmm. I did. Um, I was actually being groomed to be a televangelist. Um, I was visited, our church was visited by two different ministers, and both of them had told me that I was to be a televangelist separately. And so that's what I was being groomed towards. And I ended up actually being in a church where I had my own radio program, I had my own Saturday night service and stuff. So, I mean, I was very involved. But that calling haunted me when I turned to paganism and witchcraft. And eventually I felt the call of the goddess, um, which had happened when I was eight at first. When I was eight years old, I watched the movie Jason and the Argonauts. And Kim Novak's Medea was dancing in the temple. It's a 1963 film. And she was dancing in the temple to, and she prayed to Hecate and the goddess Hecate and King Aetes prayed to Hecate. And it showed like two sides of her, the part that would help Medea, the part that would go after Jason and the two sides of her. And I was, I was hooked. I, I was immediately enthralled with Hecate. And then 20 years later, I dedicated to her as her priest. And I, I changed the call from a Christian calling to more towards the craft side. And I gave myself over to her and I said, you know, I don't understand what's going on in my life, but I'm, wherever you lead me, I'll go. And so that's how that happened. I think it's really interesting to hear uh, about so many different people's backgrounds who have had such a heavily Christian influenced upbringing, especially people who were very active with the Christian church earlier in their life. And I'm wondering, because I, I was very active in the Christian church earlier in my life, I'm wondering if you if there's any sort of like voice inside your head that kind of comes up every now and then because you believe so strongly in the teachings of Christianity early on and those teachings are very much against witchcraft. Mm. Do you ever get this like re recurring voice, just a little soft whisper in the back of your back of your mind like, telling you resurging telling you that what you're doing is is wrong or like not what god wanted i used to i used to it, it used to be there all the time that was the haunting that happened over the prophecies that were said over me you know and i didn't know what to do with it i i was like no i'm on the right path i i know i'm on the right path and it's brought me peace and happiness and it's helped me with my sexuality and my gender identity, you know, and so as a non-binary individual. So I, I did, I was haunted for a very long time. I even had nightmares for a long time of being back in the church, renouncing everything. <laughs> what, what would my life have been like in an alternate universe? And, um, it was it was very hard. It was very hard to deconstruct and then leave 
and continue the deconstruction, which honestly, for most people, lasts the rest of their lives. You know, I used to hear that voice, too. It's very scary, and it's hard to get over when you're told for so long that there is only one right way to do things. And if you don't follow that one way, you're going to be in a lot of trouble and you're going to, you know, you're going to yeah. go to hell for eternity and suffer. Yeah. And I'm just wondering if, if you have any advice. I feel like a lot of people feel this way. And I don't know if perhaps you have any advice or uh, from your experience how you helped deal with quieting that voice. It takes practice to quiet the voice. It takes practice to be firm on your path <clears throat> and to say, this is for me, this is my life. I will not allow, for lack of a better word, an abusive deity to gaslight me into thinking that I'm going to die and be in some eternal torment despite their unconditional love. <laughs> you know, you have to use logic. Um, logic was my weapon. It was my only weapon. And also perseverance that the experiences I was having in this path were the right ones for me that were leading me to where I needed to go. Regardless of whatever, you know, beliefs change. I had to be open to beliefs change. And my advice is always the voice will be there. You're going to have to continue to use logic. You're going to have to continue to fight it at some point. But as long as you've made peace with and accept the fact, I think it started when I accepted the fact that I was a Christian. I was in it wholeheartedly. But I wasn't going to allow the doctrines to dictate my life for the rest of my life. And around that time is when the nightmares started to wane until they stopped completely. I haven't had a nightmare about that in about two years, which is good. But it's because I accepted it and I accepted the fact that I was angry, I was bitter, I was frustrated. And eventually I had to heal for myself. Acceptance is great advice, I think. And that's a starting point for a lot of personal healing. Um, so now you have moved beyond all of all of that. And you have founded your own tradition, uh, the Strix tradition. And I was hoping you could give a little overview on, you know, what's that set apart from other traditions? Yeah, absolutely. Um, thank you for asking because, you know, Strix is the, the word was used previously before I, before I started my own. Um, but what I be, what intrigued me was, is that my my life with Hecate led me toward the Greek pantheon. Well, I don't want to say the word pantheon because the word pantheon is a misnomer. Um, the word pantheon didn't exist till the 19th century. And it mistakenly was used by historians, white historians, to try and neatly cut out and separate different uh, exotic religions or barbaric religions from what they deemed was, was, you know, acceptable. So I want to say that we're pantheon, things mix, very messy, you know, gods are very messy. But she led me towards, I want to say towards the Hellenic deities and the demons and the spirits, demons, D-A-I-M-O-N, meaning spirit. And the more I researched magical practitioners, the earliest that I could get was the root of the word striga or strig in Albanian or strigoi in Romanian that are translated roughly to which uh, was the word strix. And the word strix has a 2,500 year evolution for meaning a creature of the night that turned into an owl 
and call on Hecate as witches that were in the land of Thessaly in Greece to becoming known as the moniker that was used against women in Greece and in Eastern Europe for a while during the late antiquity and the Middle Ages. Women were accused of the word strix and many of them were killed in the persecutions and the word strix also uh, these women were also unfortunately in destitute towns after they were killed they were eaten and for their magical powers and strix also became used as the word witch in many treatises and so nowadays it is translated as the word witch and it's used quite liberally in that way. So I adopted that word because it was the word that was the closest that came to the identity of a Hellenic polytheist like myself who practiced witchcraft. And Hecate revealed to me, which was later confirmed through conversation and through research, because I, Strix is a path that carefully balances research with personal inspiration. How do we adapt what witchcraft would have looked like had it continued down to this day? How would we have modernized it? And so Strix is about our myth starts with the Orphic mysteries in the goddess Nyx, who means, which means night. And night is the star goddess. She is everything. She is the creatrix. And as such, she births the cosmos. She is the cosmos. And she gave birth to, to the early giants, the early deities of the cosmos. And eventually she emanated and evolution is her love story. The story of evolution is her love story because she's trying to get to know herself and all her being. She's trying to find completion and union with herself. And the story of planets being born, planets dying, nebulas, stars, species, extinction, recreation, and growth is all her attempting to know herself. You and I, sitting here, she's attempting to know herself through you and I. We are the cosmos made manifest. Nyx knowing herself and all her being is exactly the goal of the Strix. And so we practice witchcraft, everything that we do from herb harvesting to um, celebrating the, the lunar cycles, to celebrating our festivals, to self-development is about knowing ourselves and all of our being so that one day we can rejoin Nyx. So would you say that is the core foundational beliefs of the strict tradition? I would say so, yeah. There is, I mean, we, the mysteries are drawn from the Hecatean mysteries of Samothrace and the Dionysian Orphic mysteries of Southern Italy and Sicily. And so there's a lot of Orphic primal influence within, within our craft. And those are the core beliefs really that center out our, ourselves is that myth of Nyx. That's what unites us is understanding that and leaning towards that path, that philosophy. Okay, very interesting. And as you have continued, um, so you have the, the initiations into Druidry, you started with the Minoan Brotherhood. I know you've um, been initiated into Gardnerian and Alexandrian covens. And then of course you also mm -hmm. mentioned New York Wicca. So I'm wondering how you are able to reconcile all of these sometimes competing ideas in your head when you practice? For me, they're not so competing. There is a unity that threads the mysteries. And <clears throat> whether it is Druidry in its nature-centric approach, whether in its wild wisdom or whether it is the craft, because in the end it is the craft, or whether it is witchcraft in its 
love and passion for the goddess, which we find in the charge of the goddess, uh, whether it is the craft in its ecstasy of the goddess and the, the reality of finding the cycles of nature and the celebrations of the seasons and bringing the goddess down and bringing the gods down. I don't, the only one I think that is very different would be Strix. But it's philosophy, it's Hellenic philosophy on Pan and the moon goddess and the goddess of, of witchcraft, Hecate, in her aspect as Triodides, she of the crossroads. You know, I'm just able to reconcile the fact that in the end, there is a there is a unity, there's a fundamental unity, but it has to be experienced. It has to be understood that the witchcraft traditions of New York Wicca, Gardnerian, Alexandrian, except for a few philosophical differences, are essentially unified. And Minoan Brotherhood is different. I mean, it, it's a it's a it's a it's it's it, it has a richer um, specific craft oriented deity involved tradition it's very it's very passionate it's very loving it's very it 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 sacralizes the 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 sacred the sacredness of our sexuality and who we are as as men or assigned male at birth um but i think in the end it's about union with the gods in the end, it's about coming back. In the end, all of it is a reincarnation-oriented cult. We come back, we find our way, we start to travel the mysteries, the path of the mysteries, and it's exciting because we don't. I I don't know what's. I don't know what happens next, except to know that I can see the fundamental missing pieces of the puzzle. Druidry offers this piece of history. Gardnerian offers this piece of history. Alexandrian offers this. New York Wicca offers that. Minoan offers this. I get to see the different pieces of the puzzle, and I get to see a broader picture of things that perhaps others can't. That's how I reconcile it. Well, I like that you said that to you, they're not so competing, because, I mean, to me, the different traditions I've been a part of, they're not <clears throat> competing either. Um, but there would be many who say that, you know, there's there's one way to go and you should stick with that path. Mm -hmm. um, so I I feel like they're all just different variations on paths back to source. And when you see it through a different lens, the path that you're walking becomes that much more clear. Yes. So... If you would be willing, I, I would love to hear how your experience has been um, through all these traditions as gender fluid, non-binary. It was actually, it started with, well, the Minoan Brotherhood was interesting because the day that I was going to re remove my name from a Yahoo list, remember Yahoo? <laughs> From a Yahoo list, uh, which had my name on there uh, as a potential seeker for the Minoan Brotherhood, I was actually contacted by a, by a high priest, a Minos, in the Minoan Brotherhood who was starting a grove in South Florida, two hours away. And they said, you know, hey, I saw your name. Would you like to come down? And I said, sure. So I was already fully involved in Strix at the time. And um, I had left the Druid the Druid path, I left the Druid orders. For, well, I didn't exactly leave, but I stopped practicing Druidry because I was involved in Strix. And so I went to the Minoan Brotherhood and the Minoan Brotherhood taught me to be okay with who I was because I still struggled with my sexuality because of the church at that time. And it wasn't until I gained entrance into those mysteries that I realized how sacred I was as an assigned male at birth. I was, I am sacred, I am holy. And that helped me to, to kind of 
understand my my perspective that I was I am a son of the goddess. Later, as I tr as I went through my travels, um, I found an Alexandrian coven. Now, the Alexandrian coven is interesting because Alex himself came to me in a dream vision and told me that I was one of his witches. We were sitting. In, I was sitting in this chair. He was sitting in a chair across from me. There was a table between us, and he's serving tea. And he's telling me what it means to be about the sacrifice king, the king of the witches, the horn, you know, the witch who lays, the leader who lays down his life for his people. And, um, I didn't understand any of this. I was just like, oh, okay, you know, I understood some of it, but not all of it. And then later on, I found out Alex was called king of the witches, but it was misunderstood, it was a misunderstood thing. And so... <laughs> He goes, find me, find my, you are one of my witches. And then I did find an Alexandrian coven 45 minutes away from me. And I began my training in 2016, 2015, 2016. And when I did that, I realized quickly that I belonged here. This was where I felt. But the more I studied Alex and his, that he was different. He was bisexual. He was... He was, you know, he he had an approach to the craft that was very different. It wasn't until Alexandrian and then later on New York Wicca, where it, we believe we are a polarity of one. We don't need male and female, this assigned female, assigned male at birth to create the magic. We are a polarity of one. Um, that my journey into being non-binary really solidified. And I said, you know, I am non-binary because what would happen was, I don't know. If, uh, I'm an oracle, obviously. And I'm a. Tr I practice transpossession oracular work, and in the spring, I would oracle Dionysus. I would allow him to. I would do a service to oracle. Dion I would draw him down, and in the dark half of the year, in the autumn, I would draw down Hecate, and I would flip back and forth my presentation depending on what time of year it was. My polarity would switch. And that's when I began to realize that, you know, I'm gender fluid, but of course the word now is non-binary. And I'm like, I'm non-binary. And I accepted that for myself. And it was, a re it was a relief and revealing that I could be a witch and be non-binary. It was controversial for some because they were like, how, you know, but I was like, I'm already initiated. I'm not a seeker coming in trying to reconcile myself with a path and people that may not accept who I am. I'm already an initiate and I'm already here. I'm already been accepted by the gods. I'm already part of it, the community. It was so my journey, I was fortunate that my journey took place after that. And <clears throat> I did think that it was going to be a conflict with guard later on, but it wasn't. It isn't. My community accepts me for who I am. Uh, so I'm, I'm perfectly fine where I'm at. And I encourage people who are non-binary or who are trans even that are trying to struggle the craft is for you too that should not be a barrier to you coming to the craft you know i the gods have not smited me down i'm, I'm good to go <laughs> well what role do you think uh gender identity plays in the craft today unfortunately because there are people out there who don't accept don't know what to do with non-binary and, and trans individuals um the they they stick to it has to be male it has to be female and it has to be natural and these are contradictions because our craft some can argue it's a fertility cult but what does that mean fertility you know there are women and men who cannot have babies who are in our craft we don't check for that <laughs> you know, can you have a baby and come into the craft? Are you sure you can be a high priest and high priestess? Are you sure you can aspect the great mother and our father when, when you know, are you are you absolutely sure? When I first began to study the Benoan Brotherhood, and I said it was founded earlier by Eddie Pazinski, the craft had a problem with gay people at first. 
There was a time when Eddie was not allowed to initiate into the craft because he was gay. He couldn't achieve, he could not go through the ranks and achieve third. And the reason being is because it was told, he was told that because he was gay, he could not embody the sacred masculine. You know, what it meant to be mask. And because, of course, people were, who are gay were seen as very feminine regardless of how they appeared. And he eventually did initiate into guard, but gender identity should not be political in our craft. Worship our gods, serve our people, be open to the fact that there are people that reincarnated, because we are also a reincarnation occult. We believe that the goddess tells us that we will meet, know, remember, and love again. That our own, we will come back to our own. We will come back to our people. We will come back to our tribe. We will come back to the mysteries. <clears throat> I understand screening processes. I do it in my covens all the time. But gender identity isn't, should not be a barrier any more than sexual orientation or race or ethnicity to the craft. The craft has a history of bigotry. It does. Let's just admit it for what it is. And the more we can change that, the more we can just get over ourselves and realize that there are different facets to our deities. People are coming in showing us that there's different facets to deity other than male, female. There's the middle pillar of mediation and completeness and balance. Some will be one way, some will be another way, and some will be melded in between. And that's okay. It's not gonna it's not gonna destroy the craft if somebody comes in, they were male in a past life and now they're female now. Or they're trans or they're non binary or whatever the case may be. These are people coming back to our own. How dare we assume the voice of the gods and say and put up a barrier and say, no, you're not welcome here. How dare we? If they want that, we can go to back to Christianity. So for for people who may have been trained very <clears throat> rigidly that, you know, there is only the two polarities and that's the only way that we can operate uh, and who that might not be their personal belief, but they were trained that way and they're open to other ideas and they're open to all seekers. And they just don't know how to make it a little bit easier for everybody. Do you have any advice on how, you know, we, we mm -hmm. all can grow and be more accepting? My, my advice is really to help people to understand and say, you know, we can, there are initiations, obviously in the degree, the first, second and third degree initiations. And I know this is very controversial. I'll probably talk about right now on here, but you know, we accept people who they are and um, the first degree should not be an issue. I know people are more concerned about second and third degree, where we become, where, who do we embody? Who do we draw down? Who do we, which way do we go? As far as, you know, if someone's non-binary and says, you know, well, sometimes I feel like a priest, sometimes I feel like a priestess, because Wicca obviously is a priesthood, witchcraft is a priesthood. So it's one of those where it's like, you know, what polarity do I fall into at any given moment? Um, I think one of the most important lessons that we can learn is if you are set against making sure that somebody is embodying a specific polarity, my question is the God has and is balanced through the goddess and the goddess is balanced through the god and 
there should be no reason why somebody cannot be a priest some days and be a priestess on other days. Because we have to define, what does it mean to be a priest and priestess? What does that mean? Some lines are so strict, and I'm just going to put this out there. Some lines are so strict that a priestess is supposed to be the one in charge. You know, the the man takes a back seat to the woman. And I think that those rigid lines are the ones where there's a problem. Because there's no balance between the two. And if the god and goddess are in balance, why can't we have that in the priesthood? Why can we not show ourselves and demonstrate without giving away too much about our craft to the audience. But how can we, how can we relegate one below the other? You know, and that's part of the problem is we already in a heterocentric mindset, many will look down upon men or many men may look down upon women. There is misogyny in the craft as much as there is anything. Unfortunately, it's a, it's a fact. There are people out there in the craft who do not want to see power given to another, whether it's to their priest or to their priestess. They want to hoard it for themselves. And this is in a heterocentric mindset. This is in a heterosexual, heterocentric coven. We need to get over ourselves. We need to realize that the God lends his power to her. She takes it from him. She, he taught her the mysteries. And she teaches him the magics. It goes both ways. Get away from your rigidity. Get away from your, from your, um, from your strict boundaries and parameters. Break that open and realize that the magic and the mysteries are found in both. And you can find that within. Yeah, that balance is something that uh, we personally strive for in our own coven. And it just makes sense. It makes sense to us um, to do things that way. That's what feels right to us. That's what feels natural. Um, but overall, I really really appreciate how open you are um, about all your experiences like this. And I really hope that as a group, I mean, collectively as the craft, you know, we can grow and all start to be a little bit more open-minded. I know we won't win everyone. That's okay. No. But if we can make some forward progress as we continue going over these next a few years that would be excellent mm -hmm. and jump in topics a little bit now uh when we did the pre-interview last week uh we talked about a couple cool different things to talk about and we are getting close to Samhain so I know one of the things you mentioned was working with the dead yes one of the fundamental parts of the craft of witchcraft is to work with your dead. I made sure to read the chapter in your book on working with the dead. I found that really interesting. And I was hoping that um, you could give us a few examples on how someone might get started working with their ancestors and venerating the dead. Well, number one, we have to understand that our ancestors probably were either Muslim or Christian, our immediate ancestors. Not everybody was a witch. So if you're going to set up an ancestral altar, you have to honor those religious, that religious faith. Um, you have, you know, I would, I would start with an ancestral altar, which has a white cloth on it, you know, which is in our altar cloths. We love them. Put a white altar cloth on a shelf. It can be, it can take up any space that you want. Put pictures of your beloved, of your lost loved ones on there. Um, Pictures only with the deceased. Do not put anybody who's living on there. Because you're saying if you put somebody alive on an ancestral altar that's dedicated to the dead, you're basically saying that this person is ready to join the ancestors. And that's not what we want. 
Um, the other thing too is that a glass of water to help with uh, a dedicated glass of water that's used for nothing else. Dedicated glass of water on there, on that altar. And the water represents the life force. It represents giving life and respect to the dead. And then a white candle. A white candle represents purity. It represents the, the, the transitions of where the dead belong. And so that is the most, that is the most simple way to begin honoring your dead. And once a week on Saturdays, if you'd like, uh, the, why Saturdays? I call it the day of Saturn, the day of the scythe, the day of the God of Death, um, who, the harvester. Uh, talk to them. We, we even have a bell on there, a little a little bell, and, and ring it. Pour some fresh water, light the candle, ring the bell, talk to them, start talking to grandma, grandpa, um, your father, your mother, your best friend who you lost, who made an impact in your life. That's an ancestor. And some people will even put a cross or a crucifix in the glass of water to represent their Christian ancestors, to appease them and say, you know, look, this is, this is for you. But make sure there's always a fresh glass of water. Make sure there's always, you know, you can offer coffee, their favorite coffee. Um, leave it on there for about 12 hours and then dump it out. Yes, you can dump it out, but whatever you use, make sure it's only used for the dead. Never ever use your coffee cup for the living because you're inviting that death energy into yourself. <clears throat> and at Samhain, at All Hallows, November Eve, whatever you want to call it, set up an altar to the dead. Let the coven bring people. Let, let the dead join you. And allow yourselves to open up to the possibility that the dead are as active as the living are in your life. One of the things that I did in my last Samhain was I put out a chair for our initiator, Alex Sanders, in our Alexandrian Sabbath. And... It was, it's in the West, it was in the West, and it was just sitting there, and it was just like, you know, this is an empty chair for you. You can even do this for your initiators who have gone on. You can invite them, you can put up a specific altar for them, you can, because they are the mighty dead, they are alive with us. Recognize that just as your deities are active, so are the dead. And it is their job, in my experience, it is, it, Death is the next step of evolution for, for some. For some spirits, it's their way of progressing in light. It is their way of wanting to help. They need to help us. And sometimes I turn to them for immediate help rather than the gods because the dead know what it's like to pay the bills, to suffer, to go without food, to not have these things. And so when I need immediate help, I'm like, hey, you guys need to help me, please. You know, here's an offering, here's some coffee, here's some flowers, here's a fresh glass of water, you know, if ringing my bell, and then they will answer. They help, they bring blessings. Now, the question comes, what about an ancestor who was abusive? What if Uncle Johnny was the kind who abused them and then he died? You don't have to put Uncle Johnny's picture on the ancestral altar. Uncle Johnny can still has a still has that that spirit, that life has somewhere to go, and they still need to change. Just because someone's passed away does not mean that they are wise. Just because someone's passed away does not mean they know all. So we need to understand that and accept the fact that there are different varying degrees. People die, their character remains. And that's okay. Because sometimes um, Uncle Bob or Aunt Margaret, uh, who are fighters and feisty and protective, are the ones that we can call on to ward our home. And to fight for us. You know, so just learn about your line. Learn about your genealogy. If you're adopted, your immediate family 
is your ancestors. Your friends are your ancestors. So anybody who's made that kind of impact directly on you in life, you can honor them. You're not limited just because you're adopted or because you don't know who your parents are, your biological parents are, or <clears throat> whatever the case may be. There is a room for that. You know, I avoided working with any sort of ancestors for a very long time because the way I saw it at the time was all of my ancestors were Christian and they would probably have an issue with mm -hmm. what I was doing or with the idea of working with the dead or the idea of any sort of witchcraft in general. They'd be very against it. So I felt like I would be offending them by by trying to work with them or, or honoring them. And as I have continued to work with them now, um, I've realized that's not, you know, that's not the case. That's not my experience. They're happy, more than happy to be received and, and venerated. And it's just, it's just a little bit different perspective when you get to the other side. Um, but I'm wondering if you have any thoughts on what role our ancestors and the dead play in the magics that we do today. I believe that in my experience that a witch should be comfortable in asking the dead to lend their power to our, to our spells. As you said, in our experience, many of them uh, were afraid there's a conflict between our Christian or Muslim or Jewish ancestors and the witchcraft that we practice. But it's a, until you experience it, you're, it's going to be very illogical in your brain. Until you start working it, it's going to be very logical in your brain. But the dead, even though their character has not changed, their perspective has changed. Because it's like, oh, I'm here. <laughs> And, you know, it's not about proving who's right or who's wrong in the afterlife. Logically, scientifically, we will not know. But it's, a, it's the experience of the spirit world that we have to be open up to. And so this idea that we can work a spell, like a candle spell or a poppet spell or, or something for healing or whatever the case may be. <clears throat> this is something many of the dead would look favorably upon. And like I said, and then there are times when our magics need to work against somebody and you call on somebody who's protective of you, who's been protective of the family, and you say, you know, you, you help me with this. You know what I'm going through. I'm doing this spell to bind something or hex something. And you can help fight for me. You can help fight with me. And they will do it. You know, the magic of witchcraft is not inseparable from the Christian dead or whomever they may be. I, I, I don't know how to explain it. I don't know if they see it as, oh, okay, well, they're doing a prayer or what is this? Or this is curious about me. Some, some may be adverse to working with you, but many will not because they're just happy to be acknowledged, they're happy to be brought in, and they're happy to be like, hey, all right, this is it. Not that you'll probably convert the dead, but <laughs> <laughs> that would be interesting. But they will definitely be there for you. They will be there for your magics. They will be there for you, for, for you wanting to change that current uh, reality of yours. So when you said, because you've used the term a couple times, um, in the conversation, and I've heard a lot of people use the term the mighty dead, <laughs> and usually each person means their own thing when they talk about it. So when you use that term, what specifically are you referring to? With the mighty dead term, I'm specifically referring to those who have in our in our lineages, in our in our traditions, 
that have passed away. Anybody in our tradition that has passed away, whether it is Gerald Gardner, Alex Sanders, whether it is Doreen Valiente, whether it is um, uh, somebody in a in a different tradition that you're involved in, Eddie Buzinski, you know, um, those are our mighty dead. Those are the witches dead. And that's why even if you never have a coven after you're initiated, you're not alone. You're not a solitary. The mighty dead are with you. They are there with you by right of initiation. So that's what I mean by the mighty dead are the witch dead. So this is um, this is sort of something like you mentioned, setting a chair for Alex Sanders mm -hmm. at the uh, ritual you did. And would you would you honor these past witches in our traditions the same way that you would treat uh, like a normal family ancestral spirit? I usually would kind of separate it a little bit because these are your witch dead. <clears throat> and it depends also on the space that you have. If you don't have much space, put them together. Nothing's going to happen. Nothing bad's going to happen. But if you can, try to separate. For example, on your Gardnerian altar, you may have a picture of Gerald Gardner or Doreen or... Um, Lois born or whomever it may be name your witch here um, so that's very important to have some people do put them together some people separate them it just depends on space it depends on comfort it depends on what you feel but definitely when it comes to Sabbath especially around Samhain or All Hallows that's when I think you should bring them out more that's when I think you should be like come circle with us what are some techniques if somebody's just getting started? What are some techniques that people can use to help commune with their ancestral spirits, especially around Samhain? Some techniques that beginners would really be good with are possibly because which is do work with energy would be automatic writing. Um, being open to that light reception as you're as you're praying you sit down you quiet your mind and just start writing down something and seeing what happens see where the flow goes um you can examine it after circle or after your ritual but definitely automatic writing another technique is a pendulum you can use a pendulum to start out with you know uh you know grandma are you here you know, Ouija boards, Ouija boards, spirit boards are very good uh, for that. So there's different techniques to listen to the dead, to hear their messages, and definitely doing it as a group, as a coven, as a coven work, is would really enhance the coven. I think it would really help the coven to work with them like that. So definitely think about incorporating these techniques into your coven. I mean, people talk about how Samhain is divination night. Well, yeah, it is. It's divination with the dead. They will talk to you through the mechanisms that you practice. Yeah, um, I, I started out with a tarot deck and a pendulum, and it feels, it honestly feels so silly at first. I mean, it did for me to ask questions and and hold the pendulum and think that I'm receiving messages from the other side. But until you really have that experience and then you're like, wow, <laughs> <laughs> you know? And then I moved up to the, to from the pendulum to automatic writing when I'm communing with my ancestors. And, you know, I get, it starts with just some swirls of the pen, but I get pages and pages of, of messages and it can be a really fulfilling experience to have those conversations and so i would i would recommend that anyone who has not or who has had any qualms with having christian ancestors mm -hmm. give it a try <laughs> 
give it a try, see what happens. I don't think you'll be disappointed. Um, so I am going to ask you the signature question here pretty soon, Oracle. But before I do that, I would like to know where you're going to be and how people can find you coming up. <clears throat> well, this week, um, today is the 9th. This week I will be in Phoenix Festival's Autumn Meet. So if people want to come out, they can see me there. I work out of the Sea Witch of Cocoa Village. Um, it's a it's a esoteric shop which ha we sell custom made spell candles, witch cords. I do readings there. I do um, I open up to custom spell work. I do mediumship there. One of the things, uh, one of the other places that you can find me is obviously online on social media. You can contact me through my email, which is oracle.hecatios, H-E-K-A-T-A-I-O-S, at gmail.com. So you, people contact me through there all the time. Uh, you can also find me on Facebook at Oracle Hecatios. You can find me on Instagram at Oracle Hecatios. And like I said, those are the, that festival is what's coming up next. But in case people want to come up and actually see me in, you know, at a, in a store, Wednesdays through Sundays we're open. And uh, you can find our hours online, the Sea Witch of Cocoa Village. And if somebody wanted to book an appointment for a reading with you at the store, can that be done online? Do they need to call? How can they go about that? They can email me or they can call the store or go online at the website to the see which website. Uh, when you Google it, it'll take you to the website option. And you go on there and you can book an appointment with me. Awesome. I'm going to post all your links in the video description when I get this finished. So anybody that is watching and wants to learn more about Oracle, all you got to do is click. So we're getting to the end of the episode. It's time that I ask you the signature question here, Oracle. How do you use sound or music in your personal magical practice? Sound and music are integral to my magical practice. Sound helps me to meditate. It alters my state of consciousness. It helps me, depending on the rhythm of the music and the sound, to trance, especially low tones, you know, that start out, or even high-pitched double binaural sounds uh, help me to trance. And they direct me to be able to draw down the gods and oracle. Um, they also are great at setting the atmosphere for worship. And we definitely use music to that way. It can They can shift to understand that we are worshiping right now, like hymns to the gods that have been recreated with music. So, yeah, they, take, they, do, they are integral to my craft. Do you use uh, binaural beats to help you get into a, a trance state when you do like um, possession, divination and stuff like that? Yes, recently I've started to do that and it has helped tremendously to echo one over the other and to get me into that lull state where I'm just like, what's going on? Because actually in ancient Greece they, and in India, they've used instruments like certain flutes or whatever to do binaural noises in order to induce trance. So that technique does work. Are you using tuning forks or recorded tones over headphones? Uh, just headphones. Very cool. Very cool. If anybody has not experimented with binaural beats, give it a shot. It's a lot of fun. <laughs> yeah. Okay, Oracle, I really appreciate you being on the show with me today. I think that about wraps things up. So I'm going to end the call. Thank you very much Take for care. letting me be here. Thank you. It was an honor. I appreciate you. Appreciate you too. Well, that was a great interview. I don't know about you guys, but I am just dying to try out some binaural beats in my meditation practice. Oh, that, that explains it. They weren't connected to anything 
A big M3 thank you to Oracle for coming on the show today and for being so open. If you want to learn more about him, check out the links in the video description below. I'll be talking to other interesting people soon, so be sure to subscribe here on YouTube, follow me on Facebook at Eric Arcadian, and if you want to help support me making new content, you can go to my Patreon page. Remember, there's always a way to make music. Until next time.